Welcome to the Watchdog with Loki. As you know, here at Mint Press, we are engaging in searing investigative journalism, which goes against the grain, which covers stories the mainstream media generally ignore. For that reason, we need your support. So please watch, share this video, like it, comment, and also support us on Patreon. This week, we are joined by chief reporter for Declassified, Phil Miller. Phil, how are you? I'm great. Thanks, Loki, for having me on the show. It's great to be joined by you. I also understand that you were quoted by Akala in his book, Natives. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yeah, he cited uh, an article I'd written about, um, this was about British Army advice, um, I think, for a mining company in South Africa. Um, so he picks up on that article and, and mentioned it in his book, which is great. Great stuff. Now, you have just released with Declassified the film Wharton's War on Yemen. What does this area in the heart of Lancashire have to do with Yemen? Yeah, so this, this village, Wharton, um, I mean, I say it's a village, but it has its own runway which a 737 plane can take off on and it has its own arms factory and this is where they they made the planes that were sold to Saudi Arabia a number of years ago and it's where uh, the company BAE Systems keep maintaining those aircraft so um, fighter jets are require constant maintenance almost every time they go out on a on a mission um, and so there's a whole number of spare parts and other updates that um, that are done at the Wharton factory. And then each week they're flown out to Saudi Arabia um, to keep the Saudi jets in the sky and bombing Yemen. And in terms of building the film, it's also based around the testimony of a former lawyer for the Foreign Office, Molly Mulready. Now, that's a brilliant source to get a hold of. How did that happen? Yeah, well, we'd seen um, that uh, Molly had written a piece, I think, in The Independent when she first kind of blew the whistle um, about what she'd seen in the Foreign Office. And and we'd been in contact with her since then. And while we were making the film, um, you know, we'd gone up to Wharton and done some fox pops there. But we felt, you know, it'd be good to interview someone who really knew more about the Foreign Office side of things. Um, and so we were lucky enough to, to record the interview with her and, and put those two, you know, they're almost two separate films, but actually when we put them together, it seemed to work really well. So, um, yeah, it just came together nicely. What do you think is the key to getting more people within the sort of nuts and bolts and machinery of the war machine to come out and speak about their experiences within it, like Molly Mulready? Yeah, I mean, we've seen, you know, there is there is a small number of, of whistleblowers now from the, the war in Yemen. Um, another one is um, Ahmed al Batati, who you interviewed recently, a former British soldier um, who went on strike effectively about over the arms sales because the British military is, is heavily involved in in the arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Um, and I mean, he he was a he was born in Yemen, so he had a bit of a, a personal perspective on it. Uh, and morally, he thought it was wrong. And also he'd been reading things, um, including on Declassified, about how heavily Britain was involved in in the war. So, you know, that's something we, I mean, Molly, obviously, you know, because she was working as a lawyer in the Foreign Office, knew directly how, how much Britain was involved. But um, I think there is a role for journalists there in kind of um, exposing and explaining what, what Britain is doing in the world. And then people who are involved in those systems can make their own judgments. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's also a former defense attache uh, who served in Saudi Arabia and, and Yemen, uh, Brigadier John Deverell, I think is his name. And he's he's come out quite critically about the war. Um, but it is astonishing that there aren't more people coming out, given how horrendous it is. Um, I think the workers at BAE Systems, they have kind of uh, clauses in their contracts and to do with their pensions as well, that would would mean they could be in jeopardy of losing those if they spoke out so i think you know they try and put financial and legal pressure on people not to come out against the war 
It's also one of your pieces that revealed that it was 17.6 billion pounds worth of military hardware that BAE systems have sold to the Saudi military since it began bombing Yemen. We've also seen pushback from the campaign against the arms trade um, through the court system, where they have been successful to some extent. But then not long after that, the British government were able to structure not a very convincing argument, but some kind of argument that actually these examples where whether it was hospitals or whether it was the sanitation system or a funeral hall had been bombed by the Saudi government, that these didn't represent a pattern of behavior, quote unquote. And so therefore sales to Saudi Arabia would not be seen to violate Britain's responsibility under the arms trade treaty to assess whether these sales may be used for violations of international humanitarian law. So we see within the government, there's these sort of mechanisms of justification. But what I thought was brilliant about the film is that you have several, several different layers of cognitive dissonance at work here. So when Matt Kennard approaches the gentleman working as security at the Wharton base, he says clearly to Matt, you know, we know who you are and you won't find many people who want to speak to you about this. You then also see Matt go to the, what I understand to be the town center and speak to some people about what is happening in the area they live in and the relationship to Saudi Arabia. And a lot of people are not aware of it. But then also you sort of juxtapose that with Molly Mulready, who is brought to tears at certain points because of this sort of level of complicity in this extraordinary level of human suffering. Specifically on this issue, why do you think the sort of manufacturing of ignorance is so successful when it comes to British policy towards Yemen? Yeah, I think if, if there wasn't that ignorance and people knew, um, you know, just how regularly innocent people were being blown up by British bombs, then it would become unconscionable and it, and it would have to stop. And, and that would cost BAE a lot of money, um, you know, unless the government diversified them into socially useful manufacturing. So, you know, there are a lot of vested interests. Um, the chairman of BAE is earning about 700,000 a year for part-time role. Uh, the CEO, I think, gets, gets even more than that. So, um, you know, there's a huge amount of, of money at stake there. And these companies, you know, every time you go into Westminster Tube Station, BAE have an enormous advert above the escalators. So they're completely plugged into to Westminster um, and into our government. So, um, you know, there's a lot of vested interest there in, um, in making sure there is ignorance. And, you know, the fact that Molly, um, you know, I think we were the first journalists to interview her on camera. You know, I've, I still find that extraordinary. You know, how, why have the BBC not interviewed her? Why have Channel 4, Channel 4 News not interviewed her? Um, you know, she's such an important whistleblower. Um, and yet it's as if she doesn't exist at all. And, you know, she, she knows that they're deliberately trying, they've done that deliberately. Ignoring her is, is the best way of, um, uh, of making her story go away. It's like with um, Ahmed Al-Batati, they didn't press charges against him. They just let him out, let, let him leave the army. You know, if that had gone to court, then it, you know, it could have become more of a kind of media issue. Um, so, yeah, I think the... The state is very kind of sophisticated in how it deals with these whistleblowers and it knows it can rely on a very pliant media um, that isn't going to follow up these stories. I mean, as you also mentioned, and a recording is shown of him at an AGM in the film, Roger Carr. I understand it to be uh, uh, an AGM. I might, I might yeah, be it, incorrect. Yeah, Roger Carr, in which he's talking about He's basically putting forth an argument for BAE systems, which says that the more you arm people, the quicker you end wars, because the wars become more asymmetrical, essentially. Now, Roger Carr, as you pointed out, 
earns almost a million pounds a year in his role at BAE Systems. But previously, he was on the board of the BBC Trust, which was the at that time the body which regulated the BBC. So a very clear conflict of interest. How, how much more can you sort of tell us about this relationship between whether it's BAE Systems and the media or BAE Systems and the existing British establishment? Another perfect example would, of course, be Prince Charles and Prince Andrew, I imagine. Yeah, so the royal family are also effectively lobbyists for BAE Systems, and they go on these tours of, of the Middle East, of the Gulf regimes, and you know they are there to help sell weapons um, effectively. They they are often sent at quite sensitive times when maybe, um, you know, for instance, there was a bit of pushback in the UK about some of the bribery on the Saudi arms deals, and a serious fraud office starts investigating, and that was seen to jeopardise future contracts. So you know the roles were dispatched to Saudi then to try and patch up relations and ensure that that those arms sales would continue to go ahead. Um, so they play a very high level role in this, um, in this entire relationship and particularly Prince Andrew. Um, so I think that's, that's a key element to, to understanding it. Um, and we, we did look at, you know, the number of visits, I can't remember off the top of my head, but since the Arab spring in particular, um, to, to the Gulf regimes and countries like Morocco as well, uh, which have, all have, um, absolute or monarchies that effectively control the state, um, so yeah, I mean, this is this is you know well known really, but it's it's often kind of glossed over, or you know people look the other way, um, and a lot of the reporting on these royal visits doesn't doesn't get to the core of why they're actually going to these countries. I mean, you also picked out specifically Prince Andrew not being stopped in his proselytizing mission for BAE Systems, even by the Jeffrey Epstein scandal. Can you expand on that a bit, please? Yeah, so the timing of the Jeffrey Epstein scandal, by that I mean the first time the photograph emerged of Prince Andrew in, I think it was Central Park with Epstein. This was after Epstein had been convicted and uh, released. Um, so the timing of that photo emerging and the, the Arab Spring, the, both events happened quite close to each other. And so initially there was a bit of pushback against Prince Andrew having this role as a, he was an official um, UK government trade envoy. Um, and he, that, a fit, that formal position was taken away from him. But then for years and years after that, he continued to go out to these countries and effectively do the same thing, which again shows just how important he is to this relationship. You know, these are personal relationships that he has with members of these royal families. And those are relationships that the arms companies want to maintain um, as, as a channel for promoting these arms sales. You also found British involvement in the killing of Qasem Soleimani. Can you tell us about that? So, so just to be clear, what we found was uh, in the aftermath of the airstrike, um, that British soldiers were rushed to an airbase in Bahrain in the Gulf, which was expected to be a flashpoint if there was all-out war with Iran. So it was in the aftermath of the strike what we saw, uh, rather than sort of, I don't know whether or not there was involvement in the planning of the strike. Uh, I can't speak to that, but what I can prove uh, is that British soldiers were rushed out to the Gulf uh, as soon as a strike had happened, uh, because there was such a high chance of war, and that actually these um, military personnel were given some kind of commendation or award for having taken part in this in such a high stakes uh, mobilisation. Um, so I think that just showed um, how close we came to war with Iran, which would have been completely catastrophic uh, to the extent that you know members of the British Armed Forces were given awards. Uh, for being able to mobilize so so quickly um, and again you know that's that's something that should be known about you know we've seen how disastrous the war was in Iraq the idea of going and doing that in Iran is just unconscionable um, so uh, but yeah the, the danger of these war games just doesn't seem to get um, picked up on. At the end of your documentary 
Wharton's war on Yemen, you confront on camera the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, and the Saudi ambassador at the arms fair, which recently took place in East London. Was this a, pre, a pre-planned action? Was this something that you left your home with the intention of doing? Or was it a more spontaneous act of real journalism? Um, yeah, it was, it was very spontaneous. Um, so I'd gone to the arms fair with my colleague, Matt Kennard, and we were mainly, pl- mainly planning just to take still photos and short videos of the displays. Uh, we'd both been before, so we knew a little bit about what to expect. Um, so, you know, we were, we were tweeting out a lot of pictures of some of the weapons that were on sale there and things that have been used in Yemen and uh, Palestine and other conflicts like that. And I think we'd actually, we'd sat down in a cafe for lunch and then Matt saw uh, Ben Wallace going around with a big entourage um, of Saudis. And so he said, you know, go over there because I had a camera on a, on a, a smartphone on a selfie stick, which I've used before for, for doing kind of like video stuff. Um, so I just started following them around and it wasn't clear at first that it was the Saudi ambassador he was with. I think we only realized that afterwards when we looked back at the footage and saw his badge. Uh, but we knew it was a very high level Saudi delegation and there were a lot of Air Force officers there. Um, so, and then there were kind of journalists from like Saudi TV channels, uh, and Gulf TV channels, like state control channels. So it was kind of quite a tame media event. And then, uh, it got around to part of the display and it just seemed like a good shot and it looked like, you know, it was going to finish soon. So that's when I just started firing away questions about, um, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi and the involvement of, uh, Mohammed bin Salman. So... Yeah, I didn't really know what would happen. Didn't really have time to think it through. Um, the camera is quite shaky because there was a Saudi Air Force officer trying to kind of elbow me out of the way. Uh, I mean, Ben Wallace, to his credit, after the second time I shouted out a question, he did come up with, you know, a response of sorts. I mean, it's a very mealy mouth response, but it's it's quite honest in a way. You know, Britain has had this relationship with the Saudis for decades and decades. It doesn't make it okay, but it, it is true. Um, and then that was it. I think, you know, it's, it all happened very quickly. And then he went on his way. I think there was a cabinet reshuffle that day. So he had to get to Downing Street and he was told he'd be reappointed as defense secretary. You know, he'd done a good job defending the relationship with the Saudis. So, um, so he's still in post. Um, yeah. And that was it really. It all happened very quickly. Um, I mean, we, we know that, you know, ministers do often go to the arms fair um, and that diplomats are there too, but, you know, we were just lucky to see them um both there together at at that moment were you surprised that more of this confrontation was not made in the mainstream media yeah i mean i think it you know it clearly had the potential to be a viral clip and you know on our own um channels it it got a lot of attention but um it as you say it wasn't picked up by the bbc or you know um by the national media but i'm that doesn't surprise me anymore because we've been doing this for a number of years now and we just see their attitude towards this kind of journalism. Um, and I, like, I think, you know, it was different in the past. There was a lot more uh, investigative documentaries on television where this kind of journalism was, was very normal and very celebrated. Um, and people, I think, still like it. You know, we got a great response to that clip. But um, I think there's definitely a reluctance to show that kind of adversarial journalism. And, you know, a few weeks later, I my pass for the Conservative Party conference was was revoked uh, and I haven't been given a, 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 you know, a justifiable reason for that. So I think people are afraid of losing access to things Mm. if they are too um, critical of government policy. Yeah. I mean, your stories have led to two different government probes. Can you tell us about them? Yeah, so um, in 2014, I did a story about how the SAS had been involved in helping the Indian Army to plan a raid on the uh, Sri Haminda Sahib, which is the Golden Temple complex in Amritsar in India. It's the holiest site for the Sikh faith. And um, when the operation eventually went ahead, it was a complete bloodbath and a terrible massacre 
and what I revealed was that um, in advance of that raid, the SAS had been sent out to India to advise on how to do an operation uh, like that. So this triggered two government reviews, um, the first one into how involved the SAS had been, um, and the second one was into how I was even allowed to find the files in the first place, um, because the government's view was that they should never have been released. So, I mean, the eventual review was a, a whitewash, basically. I mean, they tried to downplay the SAS involvement and say that the plan the SAS came up with wasn't used. The Indian Army did their own thing and didn't listen to the SAS advice. But actually, I mean, it does look like elements of it were carried across. Um, and yeah, it was just a review on the papers. No witnesses were called to give evidence in public or anything like that. So the Sikh community were very unhappy with it. And subsequent Labour manifestos have called for an independent inquiry. Um, and the, the other review was by the chairman or former chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee, Sir Alex Allen, into why the papers were allowed to be revealed at all. And that, that's part of just a wider pushback um, towards transparency. I feel like the pendulum is shifting now. There were a number of years where people were finding quite a lot from the National Archives and some quite big revelations were coming out, you know, things like the torture in Kenya. And this led to like a lot of litigation, uh, court settlements, and um, in the case of Northern Ireland, you know, attempts at like criminal prosecutions. And now we've got to the point where like that review was probably, you know, a bit of the start of it saying, you know, papers to do with the SAS shouldn't be released, even if it's happened 30 years ago to now where in Northern Ireland, they're saying like, even like inquests about, you know, killings by the police or the army, like shouldn't even an inquest shouldn't be allowed to go ahead, you know, because there's still families in, in Ireland who are waiting for inquests about how their families died during the troubles. So it's, you know, and it's quite scary really to see where that could be going. Um, and we've had the Overseas Operations Act as well, which has come out. So again, that makes it harder to bring civil or criminal uh, litigation against the armed forces for abuses that have happened overseas. Um, so they've, they've done that for overseas operations. Now they're going to try and do that for things in Northern Ireland. And then probably, you know, the Human Rights Act itself is what they'll go for. And also declassified was blacklisted at one point. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this this led to another review. Um, what happened was um, uh, uh, Ahmed al-Batati, the British soldier who we've mentioned, did his protest against the war in Yemen against British arms sales. And I called up the MOD pro, uh, press office. In my mind, it was quite a routine call. Just wanted their comment on on his arrest because we'd seen videos on social media and they said yeah sure we'll get back to you and then later they missed my deadline and and I said something like um you know can you send me a comment and they said well they, I'd seen that they'd given a comment to another journalist at the Telegraph a defense correspondent of the Telegraph who is a former uh, British army officer so I called up the MD press office and said, you know, you've given a comment to this guy, but why haven't you given one to me? And they said, my understanding is we no longer deal with your publication. So unfortunately, I was recording that call. So I had evidence of what had been said. Um, unfortunately for them, not unfortunately exactly. for us. Yeah. Uh, so then this led to um, a bit of a kind of mini outcry and eventually the Council of Europe have like a media freedom alert system. And they, they issued a media freedom alert. And that, that then meant the government had to take it quite seriously. And they said, okay, we'll do a review and we will get someone called Tom Kelly, who was uh, Tony Blair's official spokesperson uh, when he was prime minister to do the review, which was quite amusing that they picked him. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that led to another review, but I mean, not much really changed. They said that, yeah, a, a serving military officer in the Ministry of Defence press office had made a decision, I think around July last year, that they'd no longer give comments to our to our website. So, um, but they wouldn't tell us, you know, who that officer was or what unit they're from or, you know, what they've been involved in. Um, so there's still a lot more questions about actually what was going on. Um, and yeah, there's still more things I'd like to know about, you know, why they made that decision. But yeah, I think 
we, we had been publishing a series of stories, particularly about the war in Yemen and British arms sales uh, to Gulf dictatorships like Oman. And I think that had, um, you know, they were very sensitive because they, they, they're not used to that level of um, scrutiny um, on their relationships with those countries and, um, and journalism that, you know, it's all, it's all factual and we often link back to their own documents that we've got disclosed or parliamentary questions. So, you know, they can't kind of undermine it and say it's not true. Um, and so then this was their kind of knee jerk reaction was to say, well, you know, we're never going to talk to you again, but, um, as a pub, as a government department, they have a duty to treat all journalists, um, equally, or at least to give us all a, a response. And what was the conclusion of that review? Yeah. So the, the review, it just put in place, um, there's now some kind of scheme in the MOD press office where I think each month they have to show how they are still meeting these like civil service standards of, um, there's a civil service code about, uh, yeah, kind of impartiality, uh, cause they don't want to be seen. The civil service itself shouldn't be overtly politicized. So, um, that they had to adhere to those standards. But um, the the um, the head of the MOD press office, I think the day the review came out, it was also announced that he'd been moved to another department. So I think there was a bit of internal movement there. But um, yeah, I mean, the MOD press office is a it is a fascinating organisation. You have people there serving military officers who are drafted in. Uh, you also have the former defence editor of the Sun, uh, David Willits, is there. I think he's their deputy head of news. Um, so, you know, you wonder why papers like the sun and the times get so many, um, exclusive stories from the MOD, you know, about certain operations that weren't reported. Well, it's because their former staff work there. Yeah. Phil, you also revealed that Britain has 145 military sites slash bases in about 42 countries. Can you tell us about that and how you came across this information? Yeah, so the number will have gone down slightly since um, the Afghanistan. evacuation from Afghanistan. Yeah, um, although they they may have set up one or two bases elsewhere by now. Um, that that research was just done. Some of it was through freedom of information requests and and questions in Parliament, but a lot of the information was kind of out there, but had never been kind of put together. Um, and people talk, you know, they say, oh you know, we have a military base in the Falklands or in Cyprus, but it's when you actually like say, well, where are those bases in Cyprus? You know, it's okay. There's a huge, there's a substantial, there are two bits of land, well, three bits of land on Cyprus that were never given back uh, at the end of colonialism. They're still British colonies, but within those land, you have bits of land, you have farmers uh, fields, and then you'll have, you know, an airstrip, you'll have an oil depot, you'll have a military run school. So, uh, you know, accommodation blocks, um, firing ranges. So when you start adding those all up, you know, it's not just one military base, you know, the number on Cyprus, I think we found dozens. Um, likewise on the Falklands, you know, they have this huge compound at Mount Pleasant where everything's flown in, but then they also have a port somewhere else on the island. Uh, they have these um, surface to air missile outposts in other parts of the island. So yeah, when you actually add up the bases in these places, you that's how we got to the to the figure and i i modeled it on research that um an academic had done in the us i think his name is david vine he wrote a book called base nation and he had a similar methodology of you know actually how many of these military sites are there in these places and i think that's how he got his figure of it's over a thousand u.s military bases around the world um yeah so i tried to use his same his same method um and yeah th those were the results where was the most surprising place that the UK military are stationed? And also in a situation where one in 10 soldiers in the British military are not UK citizens, where Britain has an overseas tax haven network, which is responsible for about 37% of all tax losses faced by governments around the world. To what extent can we say that Britain is a post-colonial nation? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the military itself has never decolonized. Um, and if you look at how the military still has these bases in places like Nepal, 
where um, thousands of uh, Gurkhas are recruited each year, uh, you know, to, to staff the British military. And then what's fascinating about the Gurkhas is a large number of them are then actually sent to um, Brunei, um, which is a, you know, an enclave in the South China Sea where the Sultan, he's an absolute dictator and he has, um, you know, he relies on the Gurkhas effectively to keep him in power there. Um, and we also, those Gurkhas are also offered to the Singapore, uh, Singapore police who have an armed police unit that um, the British army effectively does the recruitment for in Nepal. So there are these kind of extraordinary like colonial setups that have never ended um, because they're essential for maintaining these kind of relationships um, of, of power that the UK has around the world. So I found some of those bases, you know, in places like Nepal, Singapore, Brunei that we don't really hear about. Uh, quite fascinating, particularly with this, you know, pivot towards China as well. I think those a lot of those countries border or are very close to China as well. So the idea that Britain still has bases there, um, as well as the aircraft carrier being sent there, was quite surprising. But um, you know that where these bases are really concentrated is is in the Gulf states, um, in oil producing countries. Um, so in Saudi Arabia, you know, we were able to map out quite a number of bases there um and things like british soldiers being embedded in in the saudi national guard and then being stationed in uh not just in the national guard headquarters but like out in the eastern province as well in in Durham, which is a key oil producing city and that's uh right next to the bridge that connects over to bahrain uh where again you know there's british naval bases as well as british troops at a u.s air base in bahrain um yeah and then you know so yeah all these gulf states uh i mean oman as we were writing that research they were actively building more bases so we were trying to keep up with that um yeah and it's i mean there was some there was a uh a british uh base in oman that had only been mentioned once in a media report because a soldier had um been involved in a sexual assault there and so there was like a report in a portsmouth newspaper he'd been taken back to portsmouth and gone through a military court martial there but that was the only reference I could find to British troops being based at that airbase in Oman. So, um, yeah, it is, it is extraordinary how hidden it is. And particularly when we hear as well, you know, about Russia or China building military bases. Um, I mean, actually in the case of, of China, they, they hardly have any overseas military bases, but even the ones, you know, say the Russian bases in Syria, well, okay, but look at the British bases in Cyprus, uh, you know, just across the water from those bases. So, um, you know, I think also there was a real missed opportunity after the Cold War to dismantle a lot of this overseas base network. And that didn't happen. And so now when Russia is kind of rearming or building bases, it's kind of, you know, it, it's much harder to say that, you know, if Britain didn't have all these overseas bases, then maybe, you know, you, you'd have some moral high ground to say, well, Russia shouldn't build them or shouldn't want to keep them. But because we haven't done them in the last 30 years, you know, we, it undermines the idea that um you know any argument against foreign military bases to what extent do you think post world war 2 you have the sort of diego garcia model of britain evacuating and the us taking their place obviously minus the sort of population transfer which has happened with diego garcia but also a lot of these bases will be likely to be shared you know what's that kind of enmeshed relationship between british military presence and u.s military presence around the world as we know here in this country you have u.s u.s military personnel stationed on bases which officially are just british military bases but when you actually look into the reality of those bases there's probably more u.s troops on some of them than british troops so what could you tell us about that kind of relationship outside in the rest of the world? Yeah, so I think, you know, where, wherever there's a British military base abroad, uh, the Americans are more than welcome to go there. And I think in Cyprus, US aircraft often use, use the runway there um, at RAF Akrotiri. So they're very much, they're always welcome. Um, and then you have cases, like you say, some of the bases in the Gulf they might be have a much bigger US presence and then the UK will have kind of a block within that base 
I think the base uh, Eludeda base in Qatar, I think is one example where it's primarily US, but then, you know, the RAF have a, a section there. Um, yeah. And that is a way, as we've seen with the, with the aircraft carrier that Britain has sent to the South China Sea, uh, you know, it costs so much just to afford the aircraft carrier that we can't afford enough planes to go on the, on the runway. So the U S Marine Corps have a contingent of, of jets on it. And then we can't afford enough, um, escort vehic- uh, ships to protect the carrier. So we're relying on U S and, and other countries, naval ships to help protect the carrier. So I think that is, yeah, particularly since world war two and since the seventies where the size of the British military has reduced but then it's kind of this inflated sense of it still keeps these outposts and we can't necessarily afford to staff them ourselves. So then we, you know, we'll let the Americans in or we'll, we'll buddy up with anyone up in the, re- anyone else in the region to try and um, just do anything basically to make sure we never have to leave these places. Um, because that seems to be, you know, the idea that Britain retreated from East of Suez in the 1970s. I mean, that just, it, that never happened. Well. Right. It's well known that uh, Cecil Rhodes once said that he wishes he could uh, colonize space. He'd colonize space if he could. You know, much has been made of Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos and their ambitions to get into space. But far less, in fact, almost nothing has been written about the British military's plan to establish space ports. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so there is this um, this doctrine now in the Ministry of Defence that space is a war-fighting domain, um, which is quite extraordinary. And this seems to have um, developed over the last few years without anyone really you know, stopping to, to question what on earth that means. There was a bit of a kind of ridicule when Trump announced that he'd have this space force in the US. But that's carried on under Biden. You see Biden now doing appearances in front, you know, there's a space force flag in the background often, and no one seems to think that's funny anymore. It's just become normal. Um, And RAF personnel have been seconded to the US space force as well. So we're involved in it. And we are keen to have our own own version of it to some extent. I mean, the RAF um, seem to be uh, leading this kind of MOD space directorate and um there's about i think six or seven space sports um around the uk potential sites where satellites could be launched into space um previously we'd had to do this with the european space agency using a site in um i think in russia or, or kazakhstan or somewhere like that uh, but now the idea is that in parts of well potentially uh, down in new key uh, where there's a very long runway where Richard Branson's um, Virgin Orbit plane. It's like a it's a Boeing aircraft that will take off and then get when it gets high enough, it shoots a satellite into space. Um, or are there, are there sort of vertical rocket launch sites in in northern parts of Scotland or I think the Shetland Islands. Uh, I mean, you know this as well. I mean, there's a there's a uh, an art gallery in the, in the Highlands uh, called Helmsdale, which has been trying to raise awareness about this issue, um, and. Yeah, there's kind of arms companies seem to be involved in a lot of these projects. The MOD have been having meetings with a lot of the companies involved. So even though they're being pitched as like civilian satellite communication projects at this stage, the military is already very interested. So you can see the direction that this is going to go in. So space is the new cash cow. Could you also uh, expand on Richard Branson's partner, Spaceport Cornwall and their meetings with the MOD. Could you tell us what you know about that? Yeah, so we just, we, we know they've had a number of meetings, um, but we haven't been given any meeting minutes yet. Uh, I think I've asked for them and it's just been months and months and I haven't heard back. So I, I need to chase that up. But um, yeah, the, down in Newquay, um, it's an, there is an RAF base there um, and it has a very long runway um, that can be used for like emergency landings if transatlantic flights get into difficulties. Um, and there's, there's also a, a flying school, a helicopter academy at the airport that's run by an arms company. Um, and it's only recently been shut down. But when, we went, when I went down there, I found that Nigerian Air Force pilots were learning to fly helicopters there. Um, and the RAF said they had no knowledge of it, even though it's, it's right next to the RAF base. 
Um, but the locals have been complaining a lot about the noise from the helicopters. So, you know, you wonder how they're going to put up with, you know, noise from kind of space takeoff flights and, and everything that goes with that. Um, but the, you know, the, the airport down there, it's got a domestic airport for, you can fly from London to, to Newquay. So, um, but I think they've struggled with COVID to make any money from that. So they're looking now, you know, people like Richard Branson's proposals are going to be more tempting for them so yeah there is potential that 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 project will go ahead in some form thanks a lot phil and just before we go it would be great for you to tell us a bit about your book keeny meeny the british mercenaries who got away with war crimes okay thanks that's kind of you um yeah so um my book uh keeny meeny exposes a, a group of British military veterans who set up uh, a mercenary company uh, called Keeney Meeny Services. Um, the origin of, of the name is unclear, but we think it's a Swahili or, or potentially a Gulf Arabic phrase for undercover operations. And the, the company was involved in conflicts where the British government didn't want to be seen directly involved. So it uh, played a very important role in the civil war in Sri Lanka fighting against the Tamil Tigers, uh, flying helicopter gunships and training um, elite commando units that were involved in lots of atrocities. Um, It also served in Oman. And again, it was supporting a very repressive regime. Um, The other thing it could do would be to help sabotage uh, regimes which the West wanted to take down. So in Nicaragua, it helped to uh, fight against uh, the left-wing Sandinista government and then in Afghanistan as well it uh, worked on the side of the Mujahideen against the um, Soviet occupation in Afghanistan um, so yeah this this my book goes through declassified files to piece together the story of what the company did um, and it's led to a war crimes investigation by the Metropolitan Police Wow A lot. You've done a lot in a very short space of time also. Um, Phil, thank you so much uh, for giving us this interview. I hope that people check out your work. I hope they really give it the the attention and respect that it deserves. And it would be great to talk to you again. Thanks so much for joining us.